Tonight I want to share with you uh, a message which really speaks to myself. It deals with the fact of that as people, we tend to evaluate ourselves against other people. We compare and we think, well, I'm not as good as that person or maybe I'm better than this one. And scripture is really clear that we're not to do that. We're really to look upon ourselves before God and that alone is our test not in a comparison way. And I want to share with you the parable of the talents today. And I'm going to read the scripture in a moment. And I'm hoping that you get the essence of this word, that three people who were given gifts by God, and that you had two that bloomed and, and grew, and you had one that decided to do nothing. And as we, as we dwell into this message, I hope that you will see the heart of the master who is a person who represents God in, in their lives. And let's just read the scripture, starting at verse, chapter 25 and verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents came. Master, you also entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talents in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take that talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the richness of your word that is given to us. And I pray, Father, that as, you, uh, as this word goes forth, that you will use me and speak through me. That, Lord, we will gain just an insight of who you are in our lives. And the richness of the gifts and abilities that each one in this room possesses. It's not about whether we have many. It's not whether we have few. Rather, it's the faithful use of what you have given us to make a difference in this world, in our lives, and around those that are around us. Thank you, Lord, that it is you that causes things to grow. And so I pray now in this remaining time that your word will be blessed and you will be lifted up. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a great story that I read and I want to share with you as kind of an open illustration. There was a civil engineer in uh, California who took $3,150 worth of pudding and he made it into 1.2 million frequent flyer miles. Now here's what he did. There was a promotion with a company that if you send in 10 of the UPC codes, which was up there on back, it was those barcodes, that you would get 500 air miles. But if you did it by a certain time, they would double it and you would get a thousand. There it is there. So what he did was he thought, hmm, this is a chance maybe I can take my family on a trip. So he went to the, went to the store and he bought these products by this company, and they, but they were about $2 a piece. And he thought, well, maybe I could do better. 
looked a little bit around, and he found a lower price product for 90 cents. However, with more searching, he found something. He found pudding that was worth 25 cents a piece, and he bought all that he could. Then he drove to grocery stores, and he ordered 60 more cases of the stuff. All in all, he found 12,150 of those individual puddings, enough to, to send him on a great distance. But he had a problem. How do you get all of these codes off and then send them to the company? Then he got an idea. If I donate this to a food bank to where they need the food and have them do the cutting and hand me the UPC codes, they can have the food and I'll get those. All in all, he received 2,506 certificates of 500 miles, or roughly 1.2 million miles. It was enough to go from California to Europe 31 times, to go to Australia 21 times. And not to matter, he also got a tax write-off for donating the pudding, enough that he could make each trip worth about $75 at the end. Now we look at that and we go, that's incredible to be able to think that and, and to do that. And, but yet, something so simple made such a great difference. Now, automatically, we hear a story like this, and the first thing we think is, I don't think I could be that smart. I don't think I could ever even contemplate trying to do that. We might do a little bit, but he really went overboard. And so this, this parable really talks to the essence of how we can take something so little and use it for God and what he wants to do. The passage that I read is actually... Uh, a series of discourses in the, in the book of Matthew on the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus addressed the audience, audiences of the day, he used the idea in a story form or a parable calling that the kingdom of heaven will be like. And this was a one that he did which he talked about it in terms of talents or money. And that this talent would be something that a person would use. You go into business, you don't go into business to lose money, you go into business to make money and to turn a profit. And the same thing that when you are given gifts and to be used for God's kingdom, you use them not to be put aside, but to be used to benefit where you are. And so Jesus began this story, he says that the kingdom of God would be like a man who gave, gave his, his um, servants talents. Now this talent was a weight. It was a, uh, what they would use to weigh things, but it also meant a term of coinage or um, what you would gain with money-wise. And so one talent back then was about 6,000 dinars, what was the equivalent of an ordinary laborer, about 20 years' worth of salary. And so therefore, the five talents would actually be about 100 years' worth of wages. Now, when we read these passages, the unique thing is, is we look at it and we go, five, three, and one. And we go, okay, so the person, there's not a lot of difference. We go, well, someone got five, someone got one. But when we look at it a little more in depth, we understand the, the vastness and the scope. Can you imagine someone giving you 20 years worth of wages right now? I can imagine if my employer, TCIS, came up to me and handed me a check for 20 years worth of, of salary right now. I'm just thinking that right now, going, hmm. No, it would be dangerous. But this is what happened in that time, that the master, with the three servants that he had, each gave them 160 and 20 years' worth of wages to them to use. We see that the talent is rather significant, that it's not something that's minor or trivial, but rather it's something that's very big. We also see that this is one wealthy person who does not yet want his money to sit idle and wants it used. And in fact, as he gives it to them, he demands that, that they will use what he's given to them for his benefit, not for his own. And as the story progresses further, we see other evidences of this master. We see the fact that there's a mutual trust. Can you imagine giving 20 years worth of your own money to somebody to use? I think of in our own lives. Can you imagine, you know, if I lend somebody some money, I can think a week later I'm going, hmm, do I need to remind them that they owe me money? I might call them on the phone and say, hey, you know, you still owe me money. Pastor Paul, I lent you, no, sorry. Um, you know, I lent you that, and where is it? But this, the Bible tells us that this master gave the money and left on a long journey. 
and that there was no consideration then or, or worry, but rather there was complete trust in the three that they would use what they were given for the master's benefit. There was no accident, according to verse 15, when it says that they gave each to his own ability, that each person received a share that was tailored to them. Let me repeat that again. The one who had five had the ability to handle five. The one who had three had the ability to handle three. And the one who had the one had the ability to handle one. It was according to their ability. And why would he do this? Well, it wasn't the fact that he liked the one who had five versus the one who had one. Rather, it was the fact that he knew each of their abilities and did not want to overburden them with the pressure of having to use what they were given. And so our master in the story leaves, which tells me he has tremendous confidence in them to use those things. And in a day and age when we convert it back into our own lives and we think of what God has given us, that he gives us, he gives us his confidence to use what he's given us. And so we read further and we see the word at once, that the man with five became studious, hardworking, and he took what he had, not knowing the time frame that the master would have before he would come back, and not knowing what would be the results, but rather at once he took what he had with a realistic idea and put it to work. He did not want to squander. He didn't want to waste the opportunities given to him. And so the Bible says that he put it to work. He used it, and he gained five more. We're also told that the, the one rather with two talents did the same thing. They were honoring their master. The question is, do we honor God? Do we honor our master tonight with what he's given us? I think of that relationship that God has with us to give us those things and allow us the freedom. Because we notice that the master did not tell him, well, now that I've given you this much, I think you should invest it here. Did you ever think of putting it there to gain more money? But rather, the master just totally leaves and allows them the freedom according to their, to their abilities and how they would work to do what they see fit. Shows tremendous power in this relationship. But we're also told what happens with the man with the one. The man with one digs a hole. He buries it in the ground. Now, this may sound uh, very unique to you, but rather it wasn't. We read in Matthew 13, 44 about, about burying things. And it was not uncommon back in that day that you would hide something from other people. But why would he do this? Why would he take 20 years worth of money and bury it and then hold it away? Did he do it because he loved his master? Did he think someone would steal it? Maybe he was shy in how to use it and he didn't know. Or maybe he felt inferior when he compared himself to the one with the five and the two. Maybe it was because he was mad that others got more than him. Rather, he was suspicious of the master. He was lazy in what he had and did not want to put it to work. And so rather than do anything with it, he buried it. Now, if we think about that today in our own lives, and we were to use something like this, none of us would take that kind of money and bury it. We would probably begin to think, well, automatically I would do this. I think I could put it this way and I gain this. We'd automatically be using our minds and engaging ourselves to think, how could I best use that kind of talent? And yet this person did not. We read on further in verse 19 that the master, after a long time, returns. And he returns not to check up, but now he's going to settle the accounts. In other words, he's going to see what they've done with their money. He's going to see whether or not they maximized their efforts as he left them totally in charge of what they're to do. And so with that day comes a picture of two different types of people. The one with five and the one with two have a, have a very same uh, picture of what they do, and the man with one has different. Another translation talks about, in verse 22, he says, Master, you have placed in my hands these five talents. Look, I've gained an additional five. It's a very vivid picture in this. 
The NIV says the word look, see. I'm reminded of uh, when my oldest daughter was younger, and she's looking at me right now because she's like, uh-oh, what's he going to say? And when she would do something, it would be, Daddy. And if I wouldn't pay attention, Daddy. And it would get louder and have more emphasis till finally I looked. And it's that same kind of picture that you have in the man with five talents. As he grabs this and he points it right up to the master, you could picture him holding this and just almost shoving it right at him, going, see, look, look. You know, almost disrespectful in some aspects. But, but the excitement of the, of the one with the five beaming because he was able to use this five and gain five more. It was not the result, but rather was the fact that he was honoring the master. And he recognized the power of the relationship between the two, the, the trust that was given to be able to use what he had. It's a very, very vivid picture. He proved himself. And when he, do that, he did that, he's almost daring the master to say, go ahead and count it. See that I've done that. Now, we can't be mistaken and emphasize the fact that we are to double the usage, but rather we are just to use what God has given us. And yet we see the same with the number two person who, again, when he has that opportunity, does the very same aspect and goes, looks, take a look at this. Now, as we look at this again, I want to bring up three things of how the master deals with his servant. In this passage, the master is really just another form or representative of God. And though Jesus is talking in terms of money, the application is universal. In other words, the talent is not necessarily about money. He's using it that way. But he's really, in essence, talking about the gifts and abilities that each one of us has been given. And so the master now gives them three forms of recognition. The first one is verbal praise. The second one is a recognition and a promotion. And the last one is a share in the master's happiness. In the first one, the, you see the power of the master and servant relationship. And we can't mistake that, that in back in that day, the master would be superior and the servant would be below. And anything that the master directed the servant to do, he, would, he must do and had to do. And there was no mistake that relationship. It was very much a top-down type of relationship. And so whenever a servant was required to do something, there would never be this form of, you did a good job. It would be, no, that was your duty. You had to do this. But the master does something very unique in the sense that he goes, well done, good and faithful servant. He recognizes that the fact that here is somebody who takes what has been given to him and he uses it. And so he does not recognize the doubling, but he recognizes the usage. And so he tells him, he gives him a verbal praise. Well done. Secondly, then the master goes and takes something further and he says, I'm going to promote you and give you more because of what you've done. Now, it's not, again, to burden this person, but rather he recognizes that here's a servant using what he's been given already. And so he's been given this ability, and now it's been doubled and been used to more. The last one is, is, is really unique because, again, in this master-servant relationship, the servant counts for very little, but yet has been given so much. Not only has he been praised verbally, not only has he been given a promotion and given more responsibility, but now he's allowed to share. He's been given a portion of what he has now done for the master. Again, let me reiterate, let me re-say it again, that this servant does not get anything out of this relationship other than he is to be obedient to that master. And yet now the master says, here you go. I'm going to give you a portion. And we see this, this master in a different light rather than a hard person, but rather a person that cares and a person that wants to give and a person that wants to maximize the abilities and talents of those that he has entrusted with. The person with two talents 
has the same sort of experience where he is then given verbal praise and he's given that promotion and he's then allowed to share in the happiness of the master. But then we go to the last servant. And I must confess when I've read this in the past and maybe you have this too that I've looked at this passage many, many times and thought this is very difficult because the master seems very harsh and it seems unfair when we read this at first glance. But when we look at it, we find out that the master is really not that, he's not unfair rather, and he's not harsh. And he deals with the servant according to the way the servant actually deals with him. Verse 24 says, Then the, the man who had received the one talent, Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, went out and hid your talents in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Let me give you a picture here of this. He first of all calls the master a thief because he's harvesting where he's not sown seed. He's saying that you, ha you take from other people and that you are a thief. And I knew that you're like this and therefore... I didn't know what to do, and so I hid it. And he called them hard. And then we see again that same word, see. It's like, it's, it's very much, here you go, take a look. You're lucky you get it back, all the money, that I didn't take any of it. And so he claims that the man is hard, harvesting where he shouldn't have. It's interesting that this servant blames the master for his cruel fate. That this servant blames the master because he was given this talent. And how many times in our own lives when we look at what little we have, do we blame God for what we've been given rather than using what God has given us in the first place? It's kind of like the same old original sin of Adam and Eve where it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. But the description is not true. The description of the... the this, first serv this last servant, rather, is not true of the master, as we've seen. Look at how he dealt with the other two. He was willing to share. He was willing to praise them. He was willing to give them more. Because that was the heart of the master, not this way. So the servant comes and said, here's your money. Be thankful. It's all here. Be glad you're getting it back. Imagine then burying 20, year, burying 20 years worth of salary. I couldn't think of that. It boggles my mind, but he would do that. So the master then begins to deal with this servant. And he says, well, if it's true that I'm hard, he's using his words against him. He says, if it's true that, that I am this way, the unique, unique part about this word hard is it deals kind of in the, in the same way that you have a, a hardened heart that the blood can't go through. He says, if it's so true that nothing penetrates my heart, then you should have at least done the, what any normal, any other person would have done and gained something. I mean, most people would have put it in a bank, gained interest, gained something back. If it's so true that I'm like that, you should have at least done this. Rather, the servant was lazy and did nothing. And what was the result of this? was the removal of the talent to give in to the one. Let me conclude with these three points this evening. The character of the master, again, who is representative of God. The Bible tells us that God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love and faithful. This master was trusting. He knew his servants inside and out. He knew the fact of what they could do and what they couldn't do, and he would not put more upon them than what he knew he could ask of them. And so with that came the love and care. As a parent, I would never put something upon my own children that I knew they could not handle, and I wouldn't be that hard person, but I would be helping them every step of the way. And this is the same of that master. He desired results, the use of the talent. We see, secondly, that talents were given by God. The talents were never theirs to begin with. They were given by God in the first place. 
And in this passage, we see that the money, the, the five, the two, and the one, does not come from the te- servants first, and then they use it. But rather, it comes the other way around. It comes from the master and is given down. And in our lives, those talents that we have, our abilities, never come from us. They come, first of all, from God. And then we use them. However, each and every one of us must give an account of our talents and how we use them. 2 Timothy 1.14 talks about a deposit. talks about the fact that each one of us has been given something that is on loan, is on hold, to be retrieved, to be used. And that it comes from God. And it's His and His alone. But we must use it. And lastly, it was never the result, but the effort. And I think this is one of the hardest ones for us to really fathom tonight or to think about. Because we look at this and we go, how could I ever double my investment as in the parable? But it was never about that. It was the fact that you had this usage and then would they be able to do something with it? Our lives are not about the results. It's not about how many trophies you have. It's about whether you use what God has given you in the first place. There are many things in life that we can't control. We can't control results a lot of time, but we can control what we do with our abilities and talents before God. It's up to him whether he blesses those, those efforts or not, and he will. You see, the master would have settled for simple interest. He would have settled for a rather lazy servant who just even simply used it in such a way to gain all the smallest little bit back to be returned. He would have missed the whole, the the fact of a great talent given to him and even returned a little bit if he had seen this, but rather the master would have just settled for something so small in return. Instead, he gave it back. And our talents are not to be given back. They're to be used. I'm reminded of that scripture that says that we, are sta- we must stand before God and give an account for our lives. And it will be those things. And then lastly, I want to conclude with this point. Those people who are faithful in what they use will get more. Look at the one with the five and the two. They were given more because they were faithful in what they did. I want to close with this quote. We have nothing to do with how much ability we have or how little, but what we do with what we have. The man with great talent is more likely to be puffed up or to be proud. And the man with little talent is to think he has little and to feel bad for that. Rather, it's the wrong way to think. It's God who gives whether it's little or great. Our part is to be faithful, doing whatever we have with every little bit and scrap of the talents and abilities that we be given. And Jesus, and we will be rather, if Jesus' spirit controls us. Let's pray.